Welcome everyone to our webinar, Advancing Best Practice in Balance and Mobility Testing for Fall Risk Assessment in Older Canadians, facilitated by the Fall Prevention Community of Practice. My name is Mariel Ang, and I am the Project Coordinator at the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation. ONF sponsors the Fall Prevention Community of Practice and its online platform called Loop. Loop is a place where fall prevention practitioners connect. Visit us at www.fallsloop.com. Marguerite Thomas also joins us on the line. Marguerite is the liaison for the Fall Prevention Community of Practice. She will be assisting with facilitating questions in the chat box today. Before we begin, I'm going to give you a quick rundown on the Level 3 meeting system. This webinar technology consists of two parts. The audio is provided through a telephone conference line and the visuals are provided through a web platform. The phone number for the conference line and the link to the web platform were sent to you by email after you registered for the webinar through Level 3. If you have any questions about the technology at any time during this presentation, please type them into the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. Alternatively, you can email me at mariel at onf.org and I will work with you to resolve technical issues as soon as possible. If you have topic-related questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box. During the Q&A, questions will be read aloud to the group. If you would prefer to ask your question over the phone, we will provide instructions to unmute your line during the Q&A. The webinar is being recorded and a YouTube link will be sent to all participants in about one week along with the presentation slides. I would, I would now like to introduce our presenters, Drs. Mar Marla Bouchon, Laura, Lauren Griffith, and Aisha Kustinar. Dr. Marla Bouchon is a physical therapist and assistant professor in the School of Rehabilitation Science at McMaster University. Her research focuses on rehabilitative strategies to enhance mobility among older adults and those with chronic disease. She is particularly interested in advancing evidence-based practice and fall risk assessment and prevention in, in older adults. Dr. Lauren Griffith is an associate professor in the Department of Health Evidence and Impact at McMaster University. And, the, and is, she's the Associate Scientific Director of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Her research interests include physical functioning, injury, and aging, as well as the harmonization of longitudinal data. Dr. Aisha Kuspinar is a physio physiotherapist and assistant professor in the School of Rehabilitation Science at McMaster University. Her research focuses on monitoring of health outcomes and are important to the people with chronic diseases and older adults. Um, the development of new tools using modern measurement methods and reliability and validity testing of existing tools. So we've got a really great um, uh, panel here today. So without further ado, I will allow Drs. Marla, Lauren, and Aisha to take it away. And I'm just going to unmute your lines now. Hi there. McMaster team? Hi. We so can hear you now. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Mariel. Uh, so it's, it's great to be here today. And uh, as Mariel said, today we're focusing on uh, the use of balance in mobility testing for fall risk assessment in community dwelling older adults. So we'll talk to you about, uh, we'll start by reviewing the importance of balance for falls. We'll review some common uh, fall risk assessment and prevention guidelines, and then discuss specific balance assessment tools that are recommended by, by the guidelines and evidence uh, to support them. Then I'll pass it over to Dr. Griffith, who will talk to you about the CLSA, the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, um, the methods and design of that study. Uh, and then Dr. Kuspinar will share with you some uh, new results from an ongoing analysis we're conducting in the CLSA. And then finally, we'll end with some clinical implications. So first of all, we're, we're really excited to have such a great turnout today. And we'd love to know uh, who is in the audience today. So if you could fill in the uh, poll, that would be great. Okay, great. It looks like we have a, a nice uh, mix of people, and so that's really wonderful. Um, okay. okay. 
So why focus on balance? Uh, we know that balance impairment is one of the strongest and most consistently identified fall risk factors. And this is a table from uh, a, an article published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that's uh, been very well cited. And here you can see, um, this is just looking at the top four risk factors for falls, but you can see here that balance impairment after history of the previous fall is the second most commonly identified fall risk factor. And when you think about it, um, this makes sense, as most falls actually occur from a loss of balance while, that, while walking. And this is true for, um, for all of us, not just for older adults. So here is a video of uh, President Obama, and if I can just, sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how to explain it. Here that he successfully uses a balance recovery reaction to avoid a fall. So even president doesn't have balance. Another, another view coming up. You can see he trips and he uses a balance recovery reaction to recover his balance. So not only is balance a risk factor, a critical risk factor for falls, but it's also a modifiable risk factor. In a rigorously conducted uh, Cochrane systematic review, there was high certainty evidence that compared with controls, balance and functional exercises reduced the rate of falls by 24%, reduced the number of people who experienced one or more falls by 13%. And then, moreover, there was moderate certainty evidence that multi-component exercise programs, and these again generally included balance and functional exercises with the addition of resistance training, actually reduced the rate of falls by up to 34% and the number of ex people experiencing one or more falls by 22%. So pretty compelling data that balance assessment and treatment should be part of fall risk assessment and prevention guidelines. So fall prevention guidelines have been produced by a number of different organizations, the most common of which are the AGS-BGS guideline from the American and British Geriatric Societies, the NICE guideline from the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, and the CDC study guideline or uh, stopping elderly accidents, deaths, and injuries. And in each of those guidelines, tests of balance and mobility are recommended. So we'll talk about each of them briefly. So the first one is the AGS-BGS guideline, and um, this is probably the most well-known of the guidelines. It's also the most complicated, but from this, um, from this guideline, we can see that when an older person encounters a healthcare provider, they're asked key questions about their history of falls, um, about their, sorry, about their history of falls and about problems with walking or balance. And if they report two or more falls in the previous year, or if they present with an acute fall, they're referred on for multifactorial fall risk assessment. If they, um, if they report only a single fall, then they go on to receive an evaluation of balance and gait. And the uh, guideline does suggest some tests for this. So they include a time depth and go test, a Berg balance scale, in the performance-oriented mobility uh, assessment scale, the POMA or Tenetti. And uh, they, while they do include some suggested tests, there are no cutoff values that are recommended. Also, it's important to note that either way, if a, if a participant reports a fall, single fall or two or more falls, they are to receive a balance, uh, a balance evaluation. The next guideline is the NICE guideline, and they don't include as details of an, uh, as an algorithm as the ADS BGS, but they do recommend a balance and gait test in individuals who report a fall or who are considered at high risk of falling. Tests commonly performed in the UK are make up the recommended tests, and they're listed here in the table. So the timed up and go, the 180 degree turn, the POMA, functional reach, dynamic gait index, and Berg balance scale. So you see a couple of, of the tests are repeated here. 
in the U.S., the Centers for Disease Control uh, and Prevention put out the STEADY algorithm, and really this was designed specifically to be user-friendly for healthcare professionals in an attempt to really facilitate the use of evidence-based guidelines for fall risk assessment and prevention. So here, participants are asked again, any participant that encounter, and any older participant that encounters a healthcare provider gets asked key questions. Um, they get asked about their history of falls in the previous year, um, they, if, if they feel unsteady with standing or walking, and if they um, worry about falls. So that's the addition here. And if they answer yes to any of those key questions, they are um, to receive a, an evaluation of what is termed gait strength and balance. And here, there are specific tests that are recommended. The timed up and go is, recommend, is the recommended screening tool for this purpose, but they also include a 30-second uh, chair stand test and a, something called a four-stage balance test. If balance is uh, below a certain cutoff, then, uh, the per then the patient is referred for further uh, multifactorial fall risk assessment and, and intervention, and if, the bal if their balance performance is above the cutoff, then they're considered to be low risk, and the emphasis is more on education and community-based intervention. So in this slide, we've actually drawn up a simplified algorithm that sort of summarizes all the different clinical practice guidelines as they relate to balance testing. And I should clarify that throughout this presentation, we're using the term uh, balance to encompass both balance and mobility as sort of the, common, the commonality among all the different suggested screening tools is that they include an assessment of balance at least to some degree. So essentially, in all the clinical practice guidelines, balance, a balance screening test is recommended for, for older patients who either report a fall or feel unsteady with standing or walking. If balance is determined to be impaired, then a more detailed fall risk assessment, which might include a more comprehensive balance test to guide exercise training, is warranted. And then if balance is considered normal, education and referral to community resources is recommended. So we're curious now to find out what you're using. So uh, for those that are in, a, in, in practice, in clinical practice, do you currently use any of the following balance tests for fault risk screening? Great, we're, look, we're seeing a lot of different results. I just want to display the results. Okay. So definitely the timed up and go and bird balance are coming up the most often, which, which is not uh, surprising. But in general, there's still a large variation. And if we think about the summary of all the clinical practice guidelines, um, and the tests that are recommended, these are all the different ones. So there's quite a large list. The bolded ones are the ones that are recommended by more than one clinical practice guideline, so the timed up and go, the POMA, and the Berg balance. And uh, the other tests um, here are recommended by at least one. We've, the first five tests on this list are actually probably the most appropriate in terms of fall risk screening because they take about five five minutes to, to administer. When we look at the last test on this list, they are, they, these are the tests that are, um, that take about 15 to 20 minutes to administer and usually are administered by someone with specialized training and equipment. So they may not be appropriate for first level uh, screening, but more for a comprehensive assessment of balance to guide exercise training. And this distinction is not really well addressed by uh, current guidelines for, for fall prevention. So which, the question really is, which tests do we use and at what cutoff? In terms of fall risk screening, we need access to short, easy to administer tests. 
And there's only one uh, clinical practice guideline that includes cutoff values to identify older adults that are impaired. The Centers for Disease Control study algorithm recommends a timed up and go uh, for determining risk of falling, and they specifically recommend a cutoff of greater than or equal to 12 seconds to identify those at high risk. They also propose cutoffs for the optional four-stage balance test in the chair stand test. And so we'll go through each of these, those, but before we do, because we do have a variation in, in, in the audience, we just want to show you a video of what the timed up and go test is. And this video is available on the CDC uh, website, which, which really has a bunch of great resources. So, The timed up and, up and go, or tug, tests functional mobility. To perform the test, you need a chair and a stopwatch, or a wristwatch with a second hand. Have your patient start by sitting on the chair, feet flat on the floor, one foot slightly in front of the other, and hands on the armrests of the chair. Put a line on the floor 10 feet or 3 meters away. Ask your patient to stand up from the chair and walk at her normal pace to the line on the floor when you say go. When she reaches the line, she should turn around, walk back to the chair, and sit down. Be sure to start timing on the signal go, and even if your patient has not started to move, and stop timing at the moment she sits back down in the chair. While she's walking, stand between the chair and the line in case the patient loses her balance and you need to assist. Observe and note the patient's posture, width of the base of support, step height, stride length, arm swing, and path. When the test is complete, record the time. Also record whether the patient used an assistive device, and if so, what type. A community dwelling older adult who takes more than 12 seconds to complete the tug is at increased risk of falling. So the timed up and go is the most widely suggested test, so it is the only test that was endorsed by all three clinical practice guidelines. The problem is, as you saw from that video, the recommended cutoff point uh, is 12 seconds, is greater than or equal to 12 seconds. And if we look into the research literature that supports this choice of outcome measure, it's really based on a single study that looked at uh, timed up and go scores in older community dwelling sorry, for distinguishing community-dwelling older adults from those that are institutionalized. This 12-second cutoff uh, derived from that study has since been validated for predicting falls, but studies have really been inconsistent. A recent systematic review evaluating the predictive validity for falls of the time up and go found inconsistent results across studies, and uh, most of the studies really were limited by small sample sizes. So the other optional screening test that's recommended by the CDC is something is this four-stage balance test. And essentially, the participant is standing um, in four progressively harder static uh, balance standing positions. So they start with feet side by side. They progress to a semi-tandem -sta semi stance and then to a full tandem, so a heel to toe stance. And finally, are asked to stand on one foot. And if a participant is not unable to stand on one foot for longer than 12 seconds in the last two positions, this is suggested to indicate an increased risk of falling. However, again, this 10-second cutoff value uh, was recommended by the developers of the test and not validated against falls. The final uh, screening test recommended by the CDC is the chair stand test. So it's a repeated chair stand where participants are asked to uh, complete as many chair stands as possible in 30 seconds. And the cutoffs that are suggested for determining fall risk are based on normative data. So based on age and gender, uh, if a participant uh, score is, is below average for, for their age and gender, then they're considered to be at increased risk of falls. And again, this is based on normative value and it's not clear whether or not these cutoff values would, would, be, um, would predict falls. So this really highlights that there's a need for research 
to determine what the best balance test is and which cutoff value we should be using for predicting falls in community dwelling older adults. And the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging is a potential data set that allows us to examine these issues in a large and random sample of older Canadians. So I'm going to pass it over now to Dr. Griffith, who will take us through the CLSA study and uh, the methods and, and design. Thank you very much, Marla. Um, I'm happy to be here as well to talk a little bit about the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And in this uh, first uh, slide that we have here. It, it has many descriptors of the CLSA. It's a research platform and infrastructure to enable state-of-the-art interdisciplinary population-based research and evidence-based decision-making that will lead to better health and quality of life for Canadians. And that's a bit of a mouthful, but a couple of the really important things in this is that it's a research platform. So many studies that are conducted are really about a very specific set of hypotheses, and the CLSA is really to enable all researchers to study different aspects of aging. So this makes it really um, helpful for doing research with, um, for example, on falls. The other part that you'll see is that it is truly interdisciplinary. So again, when uh, Marla was talking about how some of these studies have been done, but they're in limited populations, and we don't know a lot about the people who are maybe participating in CLSA, we get a, a very broad set of data that we could look at to get real context in terms of you know, who is in our studies and how, who this applies to. So the CLSA is a strategic initiative of the Canadian Institute for Health Research, and it actually began in 2001. And again, you could see here that there's 160 researchers and collaborators, and again, it's truly multidisciplinary. So in terms of this, this is a big list of people and types of people who have contributed, but as well, for example, we have occupational therapists who have helped um, design our transportation module, and as well, um, we have Dr. Beauchamp and Dr. Kuspinar who have helped us to um, look at the reliability of some of our performance measures. So again, it's quite broad in terms of who's, who's participated and who can benefit from the data from the CLSA. But essentially, we're following uh, 50,000 plus Canadians. They were age 45 to 85 at baseline, and we'll be following them for 20 years. So again, this is a, just a diagram that kind of gives you an idea, a snapshot of the design of the CLSA. But essentially, we have these 50,000 women and men, age 45 to uh, 85 at baseline. And of those, 20,000 was our target. We actually had more that we enrolled. But that was a target that people that would participate through telephone interviewing. So they were ra essentially randomly selected from the 10 provinces. Then 30,000 of the 50,000 were um, actually from around a geographically restricted area around a data collection site. And there was 11 of those across Canada. And I'll give you an idea of where those are. So again, it's not a random sample. But the people that were in this part of the study actually had in-home interviews and then they came to data collection sites where they could do some of these, a number of different tests, including some of the performance tests that, that uh, were just discussed. And here at the bottom, you could see that um, between 2010 and 2015, we enrolled all of our par participants and, and co um, collected their baseline data. And then essentially every three years after that, we will go back to the participants and collect data. So we finished our first follow-up in 2018. We're actually very excited because we actually now have true longitudinal data in the CLSA. But we will keep collecting, and we'll do that for 20 years. And then as well, we have our active follow-up. But for people who have, um, who have con provided consent, we can also link to their health um, administrative data. 
So this map, again, it just gives you an idea of who is included in the CLSA. The purple dots represent the people for whom we interview by phone, and the red dots show you where the data collection sites are across Canada. So you could see, again, um, that they tend to be where the population is highest, so there's less um, maybe rural um, uh, coverage in terms of the data collection sites, but that's not necessarily, um, there, there definitely are rural areas covered in, for example, our St. John's and our Sherbrooke data collection sites, but you could see as well that they are dispersed across Canada. So again, I'm not going to go through everything that is included in this slide, but this is to give you an idea of the um, of the different types of data, the depth and breadth of data that is part of the CLSA. And this is actually um, fairly unique to the CLSA, even among studies on aging, that really in terms of if you think about the, the um, section here on the functional measures, you could see that we could look at the functional measures in context of, say, demographic factors, other health factors, social factors, so it really gives us a lot of um, a lot of ability to look at, at these different areas in a very um, in-depth way. Um, and again, one, some of the terminology that you might hear is when we're talking about participants of the CLSA, the people that we um, contact by telephone are we call our tracking cohort. That's our 20,000, actually it's over 21,000 that we recruited, and the comprehensive cohort is the 30,000 for whom we have data from the in-home interview and at the data collection site. So oftentimes we'll call them the comprehensive, and the comprehensive participants, those 30,000 are the ones that actually did the performance measures. And again, this is just gives you a little bit of an idea of the different types of measures that we collect at the data collection site. But here you could see there's um, physical assessments, there's anthropometric measures, we have bone density, body composition, blood pressure, uh, ECG, uh, carotid, uh, intimamedial thickness, pulmonary function, hearing, vision, um, and as well, grip strength, our timed up and go, chair rise, four meter walk, and a balance test. So again, these are the key ones in terms of the um, in terms of the falls. We also have for people again who provide consent, we collect biological samples. So we have blood and urine, and there's also an extensive cognitive assessment, again, which is really important when we're starting to think about falls and balance and all of these sorts of things. Um, and then to give you an idea of the data that we have on falls, I'll, I'll maybe take a little bit of a step back. At baseline, I said it took us five years to recruit all the participants in the study. And for that, um, for that wave only, we collected most of the baseline data as, as people were recruited, but at about 18 months approximately after they were recruited, we had what we called a maintaining contact interview. And that was essentially to make sure that we um, had the contact information so that we could follow people, because it's, it's, it's of key importance that we're able to keep people in the study, so if people move, we want to be able to find out but we also collected a bit of additional data at this maintaining contact. So I'll just leave that there and it'll come back in a moment. Um, so the baseline data that we had on fall was um, we asked in the last 12 months, have you had any injuries that were serious enough to limit some of your normal activities? And if they said yes to that, we asked them if any of the injuries were caused by a fall. And if they said yes to having at least one fall, we asked them how many and about, um, about their most serious fall, or was their most serious injury due to a fall. And then of their most serious falls, we asked them if they received medical attention, 
on whether they were hospitalized, whether they required follow-up care. We also got some information on where it happened and um, what we were doing when they were actually injured. And then at this maintaining contact interview, we actually asked the question in a slightly different way. And that's because you get slightly different data depending on how you ask these questions, but it actually worked out nicely in terms of looking at some of the work that, um, that you'll see in a moment. Um, so at the 18 months um, interview, we asked then in the last 12 months, have you had any falls that were serious enough to limit your normal activities? Um, so I also wanted to take advantage of this, uh, this, this webinar to let you know a little bit about um, data access and people using the CLSA data. It was, it was uh, nice to see the, the wide variety of people who are participating in the webinar, but I, I did see that there are some researchers and we really hope that you are, will, or if you, you are interested in using these data. So I'm just going to give you a really quick um, snippet about the, about the CLSA data and access. And essentially, as I said before, it was designed as a research study, but it was really um, funded as a research platform. So we are successful in when people are using our data to help, um, to help inform policy and to do research. So the data are available to researchers and trainees based in academic settings. And in this year, there's actually two more uh, application deadlines. We'll be accepting applications for CLSA data on June 5th and September 25th. And there's a partial cost recovery model. So for alphanumeric data, it's a $3,000 fee, which is quite straightforward. But it's, it's worth knowing that um, for graduate students, that are using the data for part of their thesis and for postdoctoral fellows, these fees are actually waived. And for postdoctoral fellows, the, week, the fees are waived for one time. And again, if people are interested in images or the raw data, there's actually additional fees associated with that. But I just wanted to, um, on my second to last slide, I wanted to show you something about the approved projects. And again, I think one of the really key important things about CLSA is the diversity of, of um, knowledge that we can get in aging. And you can see here this word cloud that has, um, this is made up from the keywords from people presenting that, key, uh, that they uh, included in their applications for data. And you can see here age, frailty, health, and in, in the butterfly's uh, right wing, there is fall. So hopefully with people being more interested in, in um, using these data, we can actually increase the size of that, of that word in our word cloud. But again, if you are interested in using the data, I would be happy to talk to you. My, my email is at the end of the presentation. But as well, I would encourage you to go to the CLSA website. So um, I'd like to then pass this along to Dr. Kuspinar, who will tell you a little bit about a project where she is using, or we were using the CLSA data. Thank you, Lauren. So we would now like to share with you um, some preliminary results uh, from a project that Dr. Beauchamp and I with Dr. Griffith, Dr. Nuzmul, Dr. Ma, and Dr. Reina are doing here at McMaster University um, on fall risk assessment using uh, the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. The CLSA Comprehensive Cohort actually includes three of the most commonly used balance tests for fall risk screening, which are the timed up and go, tug, single leg stance, and chair rise test. And all of these tests are suggested as possible fall risk screening tests by various clinical practice guidelines. But as summarized by Dr. Beauchamp earlier, there is a lack of evidence on the predictive accuracy of these tests and cutoff values that clinicians can use to determine if an older adult is at risk for falling or not.
So the objective of our project is to determine the accuracy of these three commonly used balanced screening tests, the tug, single leg stance, and chair rise test, in predicting falls in community dwelling older adults, and to establish cutoff scores on these three tests for identifying fallers in different age and sex categories. We would like to look at these cutoff values by age and sex categories for a few reasons. First of all, we know that balance declines with aging and that these cutoff values may be different for younger versus older adults. And women fall more often than men, so it's very possible that a one-size-fits-all approach might not work and that we might have to look at these cutoff values for different groups of individuals. This is why having access to a, dar a large data set like the CLSA can help us to answer these questions and to, to look at these issues in more detail, which really hasn't been done in, in previous studies to date. So for our project, we looked at individuals in the comprehensive cohort over the age of 65. As Dr. Griffiths mentioned earlier, participants were asked about falls at baseline and then again at 18 months. The area under the curve of the receiver operating characteristic curve was used to analyze the data. So the area under the curve, or the AUC, is a way to determine the accuracy of a screening test and is a measure of how well a balanced test can dis distinguish or discriminate between fallers and non-fallers. An AUC of 0.5 would indicate that the test is not able to discriminate between fallers and non-fallers and that it's no better than chance, whereas an AUC between 0.7 and 0.8 would be considered good. So how does our sample look like? The comprehensive cohort over the age of 65 is about 11,000 people with an even breakdown of men and women. In this cohort, so older adults so between the ages of 65 and 74 years old, on average have about four to five chronic conditions, and those between 75 and 85 years old have slightly more, on average about five to six chronic conditions. And when we're talking about chronic conditions here, this is really any type of chronic condition that includes anything from headaches uh, to diabetes uh, to stroke. The sample uh, that we're looking at is quite highly educated, where approximately 80% of the total sample had a college or university degree. Depressive symptoms was assessed using a standardized questionnaire and about 20% of women and about 10% of men presented with depressive symptoms or reported depressive symptoms. As for self-reported vision, 10% of women and about 9% of men reported that their vision with glasses was fair or poor. Um, so, as we can see here from, from this description, this is a community-based sample that is highly educated and, and relatively healthy. So, for today's presentation, we're just going to focus on the time up and go, or the tug, given that it is one of the most commonly used performance-based tests for balanced screening and endorsed by all clinical practice guidelines. These are the results of the tug at baseline, so when people entered the CLSA. Women and men between 65 and 74 years old were able to complete the tug or completed the tug on average in about 10 seconds, and those between 75 and 85 years old completed the tug in about 11 seconds. And these values are within the range of what other studies have reported for healthy older adults.
So at baseline or study entry, participants were asked to recall if they had a fall that resulted in an injury. A small proportion of the sample, about 6 to 7 percent of women and 4 to 5 percent of men, reported a fall in the past 12 months that resulted in an injury or that was serious enough to limit normal activity. At 18 months, participants were asked about falls again. This time they were asked, have you had any falls that were serious enough to limit some of your normal activities? So now we see an increase in the proportion, about 13 to 14% of women and about 10% of men reported having one or more falls at 18 months. So in terms of our cutoff values, we found that for women 65 to 74 years old and 75 to 85 years old, a cutoff of 11 seconds or longer on the tug identified those who fell by 18 months. Whereas for men, the cutoff values were different for younger versus older age groups. A cutoff value of 10 seconds or more identified fallers in men between 65 and 74 years old, and a cutoff value of 12 seconds identified those between 75 to 85 years old. But we do have to note here that the accuracy of the test was relatively low, but these results are consistent with previous studies that have reported AUC values. So to summarize, we wanted to share with you today some of our preliminary results of, of our analysis. And this project is very much still ongoing. It's important to note that this is a very high functioning sample and different from what we may see in clinical practice or patients being treated for specific conditions. Nevertheless, these results do highlight that we need to consider these cutoff values by age and sex categories. And as next steps, we're going to look at the predictive accuracy and cutoff values for the other physical performance tests in the CLSA, the single leg stance and the chair rise uh, or stand test. And as next steps, we're also going to look at high risk subsamples to evaluate how these cutoff values may change, for example, in people with functional limitations or in people who report an injurious fall at baseline. So as you can see, our work is still ongoing. So stay tuned for more results and updates as we move forward with this project. And now I'll pass it back to Dr. Beauchamp to conclude our webinar today. Okay, thank you, Aisha. So uh, as we have shown, balanced testing is an important part of first-level fall risk screening, and it's included and it's recommended as part of all the different clinical practice guidelines for community-dwelling older people. There's really no consensus, however, on which balance test we should be using and at what cutoff value. We saw that the timed up and go test was the most commonly recommended test, but as our preliminary results from the CLSA show, a cutoff value of 12 seconds for everyone might not be appropriate. So there's really a need for more research to be able to guide balance testing for fall risk screening in older adults. And as Dr. Kutzmanar talked about, those um, efforts are ongoing. So what does this mean for practice? So based on our, the results that we've shown so far and current available evidence, we can recommend for community-based samples similar to the sample in the CLSA that a timed up and go of greater than or equal to 11 seconds predicts falls in older women, a score of 10 seconds or more predicts falls for men aged 65 to 74, and a score greater than or equal to 12 seconds predicts falls for men over the age of 75. However, as we ta talked about, the accuracy of the timed up and go for predicting falls was still relatively low. So ultimately, until we have better data, interpretation of balanced scores should be based on a combination of two things 
One, existing research on cutoff values in a population as similar to the sample, as similar to the patient uh, that you are evaluating. So, for example, these results would look different if you're talking about um, an outpatient geriatric clinic or uh, outpatient stroke rehab, for example. And uh, secondly, we cannot undervalue the importance of clinical observation and clinical judgment for determining whether or not there is a balance problem. So we just want to thank you very much for joining us today. And, uh, and we want to thank uh, our funders and the funders of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Our contact information is provided, provided here, so if you are unable to stay for the entire question period or you have any comments and questions, we would be more than happy to hear from you. And uh, now I think we're ready for the question portion. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Drs. Marla, Lauren, and Aisha. Um, we have plenty of time for questions, so please feel free to use the chat box in the left-hand side of your screen to type out your questions. Um, if you do want to ask your questions over the telephone, um, if you are on the telephone line, you can dial star 7 to unmute your line. We'll just ask you to press star 6 to remute your line once you're done asking your question, just to avoid uh, some feedback and some background noise. Um, I will go ahead and uh, look at the questions that we do already have um, in from uh, some of our participants. Um, and Ember McDonald has asked, and I believe this was um, while uh, Marlo was talking about the CLSA, did you ask only about injurious falls or falls in general? I'll let Dr. Griffith answer that question. That's uh, a great question. Yes. Yeah. So we asked about falls that had in some way limited your your normal activities. But it was interesting, we did see in the in the baseline, we asked about whether people had injuries that that um affected their normal activities and then if they said yes to that, then we asked about falls. And and as um Aisha was saying there was about maybe four or five percent of people that said that they had an injurious fall. Then, at 18 months later, we asked again, but we asked now instead of asking about the injury and then if they said yes to that about falls, we asked directly about the falls. And we found again there was a much higher proportion of people that said that they had a fall. That um, affected their that was that was um, that was injurious enough to affect their normal activities, and so we did not just ask about falls. We asked about them in these contexts. But it's very interesting in terms of research that is done on on uh, falls. They are asked in both of these in both of these ways. So we wanted to kind of look at the impact of asking in the different ways. But the the all the information that we got on very specific to the falls was part of the first the first uh, module. Great. I don't Thank know you if you know want to add anything else. So just maybe to add to that, the cut so the cutoff values that we presented here are for predicting those sort of serious falls, falls that resulted in injury or that were serious enough to limit normal activities. So these may these cutoff values are specific to asking falls about falls in that way. Perfect. Thank you to the presenters for answering that question. We're getting uh, many more in the chat box. We'll move right along. Janice Bailey asks, regarding TUG, is there a cutoff yet determined for clients using mobility aids? So, so, so the sample um, that we looked at included those with and without mobility aids. But as, as next steps, what we want to look at is um, how these cutoff values might change with different specific uh, subsamples. And for example, uh, those with functional limitations. Um, and in fact, you bring up a good point about mobility aids, those with mobility aids and we can look at individuals without mobility aids and how that changes. So that's definitely um, next steps that we will uh, mm -hmm. look into. In terms of previous literature, uh, I'm not aware of any studies that have looked specifically for cutoff values in people that use mobility aids. So 
um, they may or may not uh, be different depending on the on the gate aid that's used. But that's a great point. Yeah. Great, thank you. And um, Nicole Campbell asked uh, the same question. So Nicole, I hope that answers uh, answers your questions about the tug cutoffs for individuals with walking aids. Um, Kathy Ralph asks, can you please define semi tandem? Mm -hmm. So so full tandem is a stance that's directly heel to toe. What we mean by semi tandem is basically when we ask a patient to put their one leg partially in front of their other leg, um, as close together as they are able. So it's sort of a halfway there um, full tandem position, if that makes sense. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Sina has asked, thank you for the very nice presentation. Have you ever measured more quantitative gait balance measures such as gait dynamic stability? If yes, was there a correlation between, for example, tug and gait stability? So we did we did not measure um, we did not measure gait stability in in this um, in this uh, sample. We do have a gait speed test in this sample, and there and studies have shown a, a I believe it's a moderate to high correlation between gait speed and timed up and go performance. So we do know that. Um, in terms of st um, dynamic stability as in stability while walking using um, uh, imaging studies, um, I'm not uh, sure about that. Uh, but that, that's also um, an interesting, interesting for consideration. Great, thank you. Uh, Sarah Tamley has asked, how is fall defined in the CLSA? So it was it was defined based on self report from the from the participants, and again, it was just asked um, in the last twelve months, have you ever or have you had any falls that were serious enough to limit some of your normal activities? So that's what we considered a fall in, in CLSA. Did you want to? Perfect. Thank you. I, sorry, just to add to that, I think, I think possibly maybe what they were, uh, this person might have been referring to is, was there a definition of, I guess, what we considered to uh, be, a, be a fall, as there have been, and there have been some guidelines published on this, so um, but I don't think that was the case here in the CLSA where anyone would have been excluded for a fall that did not meet a particular definition. So it was, it was based on the self-report of, of the patient. Wonderful. Thank you for clarifying. Jeremy Rockley has asked, I am wondering about your rationale to only use data from the 10 provinces and not including the territories in the CLSA study. Sure. That's a, it's a great question. Um, essentially, part of the um, part of the reason for that is, well, actually, the reason for that is we used as our sampling frame. Our initial sampling frame was the Canadian Community Health Survey. So what we did was we had to use the inclusion and exclusion criteria from the CCHS as our inclusion and exclusion criteria going forward. And for that is done, sorry, the CCHS uh, that is conducted by Statistics Canada. And so in terms of that, we, we use the um, same criteria that they use for um, inclusion and exclusion criteria. And in that case, it was um, in their CCHS for healthy aging, it only included the 10 provinces. But there's certainly interest in trying to you know, maybe someday expanding the CLSA to some other areas and be even more inclusive. Thanks very much. And I just have a, um, another comment by Jeremy, um, who he says he's not from the Northwest Territories, but he recognizes that there is a challenge of connecting with these territories, and he feels as though there's a unique population living north that might not be represented in the present data. No, absolutely, and and everything that we that we report, we have to report in that context as well. Perfect. Uh, Melanie Holmes has asked, are there cutoffs for these balance tests being investigated for clients with vision problems? 
balance difficulties. I noticed you corrected for vision in your study. All right, so um, in our study, or in this analysis that we presented uh, today, we, we looked at uh, self-reported uh, vision, um, and, and we, as we can see, we had a small sample of about uh, proportion, 10% who reported their um, vision using uh, glasses or corrective lenses as fair or poor, um, which we did uh, adjust, but um, in terms of, I think, uh, Melanie brings up a very good point, is that in ter looking at more subsamples, uh, so people with, so the CLSA actually does a more comprehensive assessment of, of vision, and, and to look at those individuals who may be below certain cutoff values um, and how their, um, their uh, scores may change. But we also have to, it really depends on what proportion and how many of those people fell. Um, so it, it, the numbers might be small, but it's, it's definitely worth uh, looking into. So thanks for that question. Helen Johnson asks, is there any incorporation of dual task testing in your study? So that's a great, a great point, and definitely uh, dual task uh, tests are gaining more and more uh, popularity and, and, uh, and some studies have shown that they are able to predict falls. So we are, uh, they have not been included as part of the CLSA data set. Uh, we are, however, in a sub-study evaluating whether or not the dual task timed up and go, so where participants do the timed up and go and are asked to uh, count backwards by threes at the same time as they do the task to see whether or not um, that might be uh, a test that's worth considering as part, um, as part of uh, the CLSA, and, and also we're considering, um, we are using this, the dual task tug as well in a project that we uh, recently had funded by CIHR to, to look at fall risk prediction. So um, I think that that's absolutely a, a great question, and, and, and we're hoping to have more results on the dual task tug in the future. Karen Wills asks, uh, working in the area of home care, I find majority of clients are not able to stand on single leg. Do you think it appropriate to train to improve single leg stands or more preferable to work on functional activities in order to reduce fall risk? So if you look at, um, this is a great question, but uh, there's been a lot of different systematic reviews on this topic. And consistently, the data does show that the more functional the training is, the better the results are. So I think training static, a static balance position, such as standing on one leg, is absolutely fine as part of a broader training protocol where um, lots of different systems of balance are challenged. Um, so we want to make sure that we're, ch we're challenging balance in the context of functional training. So for example, having uh, participants do balance exercises um, that involve walking um, are, are important um, and that involve transfers, for example, uh, such as getting in and out of a chair while challenging balance, those are going to be the most effective. Perfect. Thank you so much for answering those questions. Uh, I believe those are all of the questions that have come into the chat box and finishing with perfect timing. Um, Kathy Harbridge just had a comment, great summary of the evidence and the challenges of working in fall prevention with older adults. Thank you. Um, so that's, uh, thank you very much for that comment, Kathy. Um, if anybody has any other questions that we, uh, we didn't get to during this webinar, please feel free to send me an email or I will put um, the presenter's contact information up there in case you would like to get connected with them. Um, a huge thank you to our three panelists um, for presenting today. Uh, the, the topic of fall risk assessments is a, a very popular one and I know it's a question that we get asked all the time on Loop, so this is a very interesting um, a very interesting topic to hear about and also great to hear about the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging and where to get more information on accessing data. Uh, as well, I would like to thank all of our participants today for joining us and engaging in a great discussion. 
For more information about the Fall Prevention Community of Practice, please visit loop at fallsoup.com. And this, or last year, I should say, we launched a new online community of practice for children's fall prevention called Loop Junior. So if you have a passion and interest for children's fall prevention, please join us at www.jr.fallsleep.com. Please don't close this window just yet. Wait until you have been redirected to the next screen where a brief evaluation survey will launch in your browser. We always appreciate if you could provide feedback so that we can continue to offer high-quality webinars. Thank you all very much, and have a wonderful weekend. See you next time.